I'm Betty Johnson, Assistant Dean for Faculty and Staff Diversity, Development and Leadership at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, where we are committed to solving serious health and social problems facing the world. Our success in addressing these issues has huge implications for the future. No factor is more important to this pursuit than outstanding leaders. Therefore, the goal of Voices in Leadership is to highlight the experiences of those confronting these major challenges and to better understand what effective leadership is and how it can affect change. We believe these lessons and insights should be shared widely and thank you for joining us today. Good afternoon and welcome to Voices in Leadership. My name is Eric Anderson, the Deputy Director of this program and I have the privilege of introducing our distinguished guest today. Many great leaders have deep empathy and Governor Ted Strickland is as empathetic as anyone who has ever served in public life. The inner calling to help people in need has guided him throughout his career. Strickland has served as an ordained United Methodist minister and a psychologist. He's worked as an administrator at a United Methodist Children's Home, a professor of psychology at Shawnee State University, and a consulting psychologist at the Southern Ohio Correctional Facility. Strickland was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1992. After 12 years of representing the people of southeastern Ohio and Washington, he set his sights on the state capitol. Elected to the office of governor in 2006, he, like the country, was blindsided by the Great Recession. Forced to adjust his priorities, Governor Strickland tackled the crisis with a plan to ensure that Ohio emerged from the recession stronger than ever. Under his leadership, Ohio won the Governor's Cup from Site Selection Magazine for its success in economic development. After leaving office in 2010, Governor Strickland served as a resident fellow at Harvard's Institute of Politics. He was a U.S. alternate delegate to the United Nations General Assembly and was a member of the Governor's Council at the Bipartisan Policy Center. He was also president of the Center for American Progress Action Fund before running for the Senate in 2016. He is currently serving as a Mentral Senior Leadership Fellow. Before I turn this discussion over to our mo moderator, Professor John McDonough, please join me as we welcome Governor Ted Strickland to the Voices in Leadership series at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Thank you. Governor Strickland, yes. it's a pleasure and honor Professor, to have you join with us you. today. Thank you. So, 12, 16 years in public office, 12 in Congress, four as governor of Ohio. What, what, you have to have some lasting impressions and lessons from that experience and all that you went through. What are some of the key lessons that you keep and you can't get rid of no matter how hard you try? What did you, uh, you learn? Uh, that you never give up. If there's something you, you desire to do, you never give up. You know, I ran for the House of Representatives four times before I won. And after I won, the next election, I lost. And then the next election, I won. And so if I've learned anything in public life, it's that you've got to be persistent and you've got to be resilient. And if you, if you desire to do something, you never give up. Um, my friend, Congressman John Lewis, um, has said uh, many times, I've heard him speak, and he says frequently when he ends his speeches, never give up, never give out, and never give in. And I think that's, that's the kind of attitude you need when you enter the, you know, the chaotic world of, um, of politics. Your district in the House um, that you took over in the early and mid-1990s yes. is in some ways ground zero for the national opioid epidemic. It and is. you experienced it early on, way before it really caught the yes. public eye. Can you talk about sort of what you saw over sure. that really critical period between the mid-1990s and 2010 when you left yes. over and yes. what, you, um, what you observed, what you learned, and what you were able to get done about it? Well, you know, this, this crisis that we all now recognize did not happen uh, in an instant. It developed over time. And uh, when I was uh, a congressman representing a poor Appalachian district, uh, I became aware of certain things that were happening in my district. For example, I get a call from 
some business people at this little strip mall in my hometown of Lucasville, Ohio. And they said, something's going on with these doctors that are located in our strip mall. Our, our customers can't find a place to park. So I go there on a, on a weekend and I look in the window and I see a handwritten sign taped to the wall that says all doctor's visits, $75 cash. They wouldn't take credit cards. They wouldn't take insurance. They only took cash. And I had one of my staff go to the, the fast food restaurant right across the street. And I said, go there and, and just watch and see what's happening. And she called me and she said, Ted, she said, young people are coming out of there, giving each other the high five, waving their prescriptions. And that group of physicians were there for a few weeks and then they moved to Chillicothe, Ohio. I went there, looked in the window, the same thing. They were there for a few weeks, then they went to Lawrence County, Ohio, and they set up shop in a, in a broken down former bar. And I went to the sheriff in that county and he said to me, Congressman, we had a young man who injected himself in the groin and died before he pulled his pants up. He said, this is going to be dealt with one way or the other. And a couple of weeks after that, that place burned to the ground. So then those doctors went to Jackson, Ohio. I'm not exaggerating. This happened. And um, I called the, the Ohio Medical Association. And they said to me initially, Congressman, we can't tell our doctors how to practice medicine. And I said, give me a break. I, I was a psychologist. There are standards of care. I called the FBI. The FBI asked that I not inform any local law enforcement about what was going on. The bottom line is that this problem was developing. We, we, there were pill mills all over my congressional district, uh, opioid um, uh, abuse was so prevalent. And I'm glad it's now recognized, but it took it a long, long time. And, um, and uh, this scourge, uh, as, as you may know, uh, has been centered in certain areas of the country. And one area has been the Appalachian area, the poor Appalachian area. Uh, where there is, has been lack of treatment uh, available oftentimes. Some of that is changing, but, uh, but that's what I experienced as a congressman and then as governor. And as governor, um, I, I developed the Ohio Prescription Drug Task Force. We pulled together uh, law enforcement. We pulled together the physician community. We pulled together the community of faith. And um, we came up with uh, 20 broad-based recommendations dealing with uh, law enforcement, dealing with uh, public health issues, dealing with treatment issues, and dealing with regulatory changes that needed to be taken place. Um, so uh, this is an ongoing problem. Um, but as I said, it didn't just develop at a moment in time. It, it occurred over many years. Mm -hmm. And of course, you, you also have had a very special relationship in the correctional system. You actually worked sure, in I did. a prison for a while. And that's also related to this, but also on a different trajectory. What, what, what did you observe from your time working inside a correctional facility? And then what were you able to yeah. bring then to public service from those lessons? Well, you know, I, I was a psychologist before I uh, entered the politics, and I worked for more than. Did you ten ever try to diagnose yourself? <laughs> <laughs> well, when I first went to the House of Representatives, the joke was, "This is a, an interesting story. It's someone leaving prison and coming to Congress rather than leaving Congress and going to prison." Uh, so, so um, but uh, I worked for some ten years at a maximum security institution. And I worked with a lot of younger people who, who were spending many years in prison, oftentimes as a result of drug involvement. Um, but but our, our criminal justice system is, is something that I cared a lot about when I was governor, obviously, because of that experience. And so, um, so we passed a law in Ohio. Um, and that law had to do with how crime scenes are dealt with, how DNA evidence is collected and stored, 
how lineups are conducted, because we all know that perhaps the most convincing evidence for a jury is eyewitness testimony. And some of the most unreliable evidence is eyewitness testimony. And so we changed our procedures for lineups so that the person conducting the lineup did not know which of the subjects was the suspect to try to take that bias out of the process. And when I signed that bill in our cabinet room in the state capitol, there were media people there, there were advocacy groups there, but there was a gentleman there, an African-American gentleman who had spent more than 25 years in prison for a rape he did not commit because of eyewitness testimony. And he was cleared through DNA evidence. And he held up his hand and he said, Governor, don't you remember me? And I said, where did I meet you? And he said, you were my psychologist when I was in prison in Lucasville. So I took him in the governor's office and we got our pictures made together. And I said to him, eight or nine years ago when we were both in prison, neither one of us knew we were going to end up in the governor's office. <laughs> But you know, you cannot, you cannot return 25 years to a person. And so our criminal justice system, I, th I think, is in need of reform. In my judgment, we lock up too many people for too long a period of time. And uh, this is a system that needs to be reformed significantly. And I was hopeful that that could happen at the federal level. I mean, last year, there was you know, a year before last, there was, there was talk about both Democrats and Republicans wanting to get together and really do something significant with our criminal justice system. It didn't happen. I, I am hopeful that it will at some point in the future. Mm -hmm. so, so 12 years in the House, four years is in the governor's mansion. What, what did you observe about the difference between serving <laughs> yeah. in Congress and the House of Representatives and serving as governor, what were the kind of striking differences for you that really are most important? Well, let me tell you how I got to the governor's office. You know, I had spent a good part of my life trying to get into the House of Representatives. And one day I got a call from Senator Harry Reid. And he said, uh, Congressman, would you come over to my office? I'd like to talk with you. And I said, sure. So I go over there. I didn't know Senator Reid, but when I got over there, Senator Stabenow was there, Senator uh, Schumer was there, Senator Durbin was there. They said, we've been looking at your background. We think you'd be a good Senate candidate. And uh, I asked them to do a poll for me, and it came back looking not so bad. And my chief of staff, who had worked in the, in the Senate for Senator John Glenn, uh, he said, well, if you're willing to take a chance on leaving the House, why don't you run for governor? because governors can do things that legislators can't do. And I found that to be true. And uh, if I could just give you one example. You know, I was governor during the Great Recession and we had limited resources. But we had gotten a large tobacco settlement from the tobacco industry. And I securitized that money. I got over $5 billion in cash as a result of that. I couldn't use it to balance our budget but I could use it for things that were worthy. And so I put $3.5 billion into building 300 brand new schools that were all LEED certified. You know, I said to my staff, how do I make sure that all of these schools are built uh, with energy efficiency standards in mind? And they said to me, you're the governor. All you've got to do is say we're going to do it. And so Ohio has now 300 brand new energy efficient schools. Why was that important? Well, when I was congressman, I would visit some of these poor Appalachian schools and I would wipe a, a, a white cloth over the computer keys in these classrooms. And then I would look at the cold, cold soot on that white cloth. And I would travel around my state saying, we got to do something about this. And so there was great enthusiasm for using these resources. But not only did we create schools, we created jobs in the process. And you can't do that when you're a legislator. You know, you're one of many. Um, but when you're a governor, you can actually make decisions that have tangible results that you can see. And that's a major difference between 
being a legislator and being an executive. Of course, when, you, when you're a legislator and something horrible happens, like, say, the collapse of the economy in 2008, you can kind of duck a little Spread bit. Spread the blame. Spread the blame. Yeah. But when you're, but yeah. when you're governor, yeah. you're in the line of fire, even though you didn't create the economic collapse. So what's, what's it like being governor when the whole economy craters all around you? It's very, very difficult. Uh, I, I can tell you, you, can, you lay awake nights. Um, um, one of the things I did when I was governor was expand some of the services that we could provide through Medicaid that was optional. And when I was a congressman, I visited this little broken down mobile home with a visiting nurse. And I met a, a large a, a obese woman there who was literally panting. And I found out that her oxygen had expired and she, she could not afford her oxygen. I, uh, there was a man leaning against the door, bib overalls, you know, an old country guy. And I assumed that he was her husband. And, and I said, are you, are you the husband? And he said, um, no, but I used to be. He said, we were told that if we weren't married, my wife may be able to get more benefits. I said, how, how long had you been married? He said, more than 50 years. And I remembered that when I became governor. And so I decided to expand Medicaid as an optional service for in-home oxygen care. And as we were going through the budget, trying to find ways to cut expenditures, I remember we were at the governor's residence on a weekend. We put a, a board up on the wall. We were going through the budget item by item, looking for how we could save a dollar here or a dollar there. And one of my staff wrote oxygen. And I say, we're not going to go there. You know, we're not going to deprive oxygen. But those are the gut-wrenching decisions because, you know, when I was in Congress, I could propose legislation that didn't have to worry about having a balanced budget. But I think all but, all but uh, one of our states in, in, in our country requires a balanced budget at the state level. And so you're forced to make really gut-wrenching decisions. And uh, I'm glad I was governor during that difficult time because, quite frankly, I don't want don't to brag on myself, but I'm glad I was the one making those decisions because I, I tried to keep the state in a stable position. Uh, I tried to protect education. I tried to keep the social safety net, economic safety net in place, but I had to make difficult decisions. And um, that very likely was a factor in my failure to win, win re-election, but that's, that's the way things work sometimes, you know. So. As a psychologist and then going into public <clears throat> service, you have a unique perspective on mental health and yes. mental health policies and, and, and behavioral health. Um, and we've had some big progress over the past 10 years we with have. mental health parity and the expansion of uh, mental health benefits to mm -hmm. all health insurance policies. Um, what, yeah. what do you think are the challenges? There's a big effort now to try to integrate behavioral health into overall medical care. But as you look at the landscape today, what, what, what's some of the unfinished work that you really think needs to well, be emphasized? Yeah, yeah. I, th I think we've moved in, in very significant ways. First of all, in just recognizing that, that mental health problems are, are largely biologically based problems, you know, the, the most serious of those problems. Um, and, th and that there does need to be parity. We, we fought, I fought long before I got into politics. Uh, I fought for mental health parity through insurance and so on. So we've come a long way. Um, I, th I think the public attitudes about mental illness have changed dramatically. Um, um, people understand that it isn't, you know, a disease or an illness that can be treated appropriately uh, given the right options available to people. And so I think we've come a long way, but we've got a long way to go. There is, there is still stigma attached to, to mental illness, um, and we've got a lot to learn. New medicines have been developed. I mean, I, when I was a young psychologist working with psychiatrists, about the only medication available to us was Thorazine. Um, and so new medications have been and are being developed, and that's wonderful. Um, um, but we. We've got a ways to go before I think 
uh, mental illnesses are treated um, with, at the same level of parity as our uh, more recognized physical illnesses are. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the cures end up being problems in and of themselves. Big movement in the late 90s to treat pain as the fifth vital sign and to provide narcotics uh, with a lot of false information. Yes. Um, and, uh, and then that creates the OxyContin crisis that c becomes part of the whole opioid crisis. Um, yes. was, was, there, was there a failure to foresee what was going on? And, and um, what can we learn from that experience, do you think? Well, I, I think sometimes we do things with good intentions that have negative results. Um, the the so-called, and I don't want to, I mean, this is controversial, but the patient satisfaction component that uh, has now been uh, required of hospitals and physicians. I, th I think is, I mean, physicians say to me, we are under tremendous pressure to make sure that our patients don't complain about the fact that we haven't been sensitive to their pain. Um, but, but when you've got a, an epidemic like this and when you have people who are uh, addicted to these substances, I, th I, th I think it's problematic when physicians don't feel as if they can exercise their best judgment but are being pressured to try to, to keep their patients happy when uh, doing that may not be in the patient's best interest. And, and, and so there are, there are things we can change and learn. I think we are learning. Um, medically assistant treatment for, for these addictions is becoming more widely available, um, and, and that's wonderful. Uh, in, in Ohio, clinics are being developed that, uh, that are using uh, Vivitrol and Suboxone and, uh, you know, as well as methadone as, as, uh, as a way to try to help people deal with these, uh, these addictions. So uh, we're doing better. We need to do more. But I, I'm feeling rather hopeful that we have finally recognized the seriousness of this crisis, this, this epidemic, and we're starting uh, in, in a bipartisan way, quite frankly, to, um, to try to find appropriate solutions. One, one other issue that's um, in the title of our talk is, uh, is guns. You come from a part <laughs> of the country where yeah. there are a lot of guns, and sure. it's, a, it's an important issue, and you dealt with it as a member of Congress yeah. and then as governor. How did that issue play out for you, and what stands in your mind well, about Well, you know, um, I, I grew up in Appalachia. I, my family always had guns that was hunting and so on and so forth. And I used to be uh, a member of the NRA and a supporter of the NRA. Um, I, I, I changed my attitude toward toward public policy regarding guns, um, as I thought that the, the so-called Second Amendment folks were becoming increasingly radicalized and rejecting every attempt to bring about common sense solutions to gun violence. And as a result, uh, when I was running for the Senate in August of 2016, there was a newspaper story that said um, the NRA had, up to that point, spent $1.7 million to defeat me, more than they had spent in all other congressional races combined. And quite frankly, I, I feel some level of pride in that. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I, you know, I want to respect people who, you know, who have different opinions about uh, the Second Amendment. Uh, I think there's some very sincere folks, um, but I do think we can find common sense solutions. I mean, uh, universal background checks make so much sense. They wouldn't solve every problem, but they would solve part of the problem. And, and I think there are things like that that we can do to protect constitutional rights while making us a safer people and a safer society. So, but you, you bring up, you, you ran for the United States Senate. Yes. In 2016 against Senator Portman, Portman yes. Rob Portman. Um, and obviously you're not in the Senate, so I think yeah, we can well, guess the yeah. results. Yeah. <laughs> um, what, 
and, and that was that was the year of the Trump Clinton fight. What, what did you see? What did you feel on the ground? Were you surprised? Uh, what was it like to be uh, in one of the ground zero states in 2016 in such a high profile yeah. way? What did what? You know, it was. I mean, it was it was really tough. And that brings me to something that I really am concerned about in terms of of the future of the country, and that's the unregulated money that's pouring into our system. And I don't want to talk in a self-serving way here, but I was at least tied and in, in some polls slightly ahead of my opponent up until about August. Um, but I ended up having about $60 billion spent against me. And it was, it was, it was impossible to confront that kind of expenditure. And so I, you know, I do, I do think the country is is uh, is uh, facing a difficult set of circumstances. The Supreme Court basically has has said that money is speech, and and um, and I think that's a problem because if you've got a lot of money, a lot of money, you got a lot more speech than the average person. Um, but you know, I, I want to be hopeful and helpful, and um, and going forward, uh, I, I am hopeful. And let me tell you why. There are a lot more people uh, covered with health care today than there was a handful of years ago. 700,000 Ohioans have health care coverage now because Governor John Kasich, the guy who defeated me, chose to expand Medicaid. 700,000 Ohioans. That's wonderful. Um, when it comes to women uh, and an and acknowledgment that, that women have been discriminated against, not only socially and culturally, but economically. I think we're coming to grips with that. I think we're, you know, we've made a lot of progress when it comes to that issue. So I think things are getting better. That does not mean that there aren't blips. You know, we're talking about the, the, the stock market today, the fact that it went up and up and up, and all of a sudden it went down. Well, there are, you know, there are ups and downs in, in the progress, but as as uh, Dr. Martin Luther King said, and I believe that, the, that the, the moral arc of the universe bends toward justice. And I think we are seeing real progress uh, over time uh, in spite of the you know, perhaps temporary frustrations that we feel now. But let me tell you probably the major reason that I feel hopeful. Um, when I was about five years old, my family's home burned to the ground. And dad was a steel worker. There were nine of us kids. We had nothing. Um, but we had a, a chicken house, a chicken shack. And my dad and brothers uh, used cardboard for plasterboard. And anyway, we, we slept in that chicken shack for a period of time. And I went to a one-room country school. One teacher, four grades about 35 students total. And we had outdoor toilets. We had an outdoor well with a pump. You know, I know what it means to prime the pump. <laughs> and um, and uh, so I went from the chicken shack to the Ohio governor's residence. And I went from a one-room country school to spending time here at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. <laughs> and to me, that's remarkable. And that gives me hope because I have experienced hopefulness in my life. So, Governor, you never, you never let losses get you down. Never. So I hope this isn't your last chance at <laughs> elective office, and we'll see. But thank you very much for joining us today, and it's a real honor to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Thank you.